with block frauds, run the ship, Stripe Network, and Netra. And my colleague uh, Melissa will introduce them later to you. Quickly to the agenda. First, I will continue with an introduction about the Blockchain Founders Group and introducing the two great judges that we have today. Then we will continue with the startup pitches. They have seven minutes to pitch their startups, followed by four minutes of Q&A by the judges. And after the pitches, we will announce the two top teams of today's pitches based on the scores from the judges. I'm super glad to be your host today, together with Melissa. My name is Jonah Hauch. I'm based in Lima, Peru, and within the Blockchain Founders Group, I'm a business development associate, meaning I help to boost ours and our startup's growth. Uh, Melissa, can you please also introduce yourself? Yeah, sure thing. Hi, everybody. I'm Melissa. I'm the Marketing and Operations Manager with BFG Superstars. So a large part of what I do is what you see here, the pitch events, and also I coordinate uh, partnerships with startups and uh, yeah, uh, and investors alike. So we are really much about connecting with startups and helping them find footing in you know, the world of funding and fundraising. So glad to have all of you here today. Great. Thanks, Melissa. In case you're an investor interested in connecting with us or specifically with one of the startups pitching today, or in case you're interested to start your own startup in the Web3 space, please feel free feel free to reach out uh, to either me or Melissa, write us an email, connect on LinkedIn. You can find us by our names or start by visiting our website. And do not miss any of our upcoming pitch days or other announcements. Make sure you're following BFG on LinkedIn, Twitter, and Medium. About the Blockchain Founders Group, we're a venture capital firm and company builder and we are based in Germany and Liechtenstein. We do mainly two things. On the one hand side, we invest in early stage Web3 startups, usually with ticket sizes between 200 to 500,000 euros. On the other hand, we're doing company building for which we have launched the BFG Superstars program about one year ago. Within this Web3 incubation program, we help our participants to accelerate their launching phase. So they will have a ready product within 12 weeks. And so far, we have founded 15 exceptional startups within our program. Looking on this overview of the selection of some of the startups that we've uh, invested in, we have, for example, Wenli, who is quite famous. They're doing wallet services and building NFT marketplaces. There is um, SignaX. They're doing Metaverse asset creation and curation. And we have, as another example, Ecolens, who prepared so far over 3,000 uh, talents for the Web3 space, filling the needed gap of talents and connect them there, connecting them to employers. Let's continue with introducing the uh, BFG team. The Blockchain Founders Group has initiated by parts of the executive team and board of directors. New in the team, we have Sarah Gottwald, who just shortly joined the BFG team as our new managing director. She spent nine years at BMW, working in the financial sector and in the strategy department, focusing on fully autonomous driving while negotiating various collaborations with startups, corporate companies and closing M&A deals. With Martina Dunzer Davis and Thomas Dunzer, we got the law and regulatory part covered. Martina has a post degree in intellectual property law and worked as an industrial patent attorney. And Thomas is the director of the Office for fi Financial Market Innovation of the Principality of Liechtenstein played a key role regarding the Liechtenstein Blockchain Act and is one of the international thought leaders in the regulation of the token eco economy. Then we have Ulrich Spindler. He's a very successful serial entrepreneur who has founded and sold a big online pharmacy. He perfectly combines deep technical um, he perfectly combines deep technical knowledge with uh, entrepreneurial focus. 
MBF professor, Dr. Uh, Philip Sandner, who founded the Frankfurt School Blockchain Center, was ranked one of the top 30 economists, econom economists by the um, FAZ, which is a famous German newspaper. And as a little fun fact, he got called the crypto pope in the German media once. A big shout out to our core team. We have Max, who is head of corporate development, Chong and Albert, who are the program managers of our incubator, the BFG Superstars program. We have Melissa, she introduced already herself. Um, Elias is our research associate and is creating amazing content. And um, last but not least, there's me. I also introduced myself already. To finish the introduction, it's fantastic to have uh, you here today, Benjamin and Abdallah. Um, I would like to ask you to quickly introduce yourself. Um, Benjamin, please start. Surely. Um, hi, everyone. My name is Ben. Uh, I'm one of three partners of a venture firm called BFC. Um, we invest in early stage um, crypto projects, so pre seed and seed. 250k tickets uh, on average, um, quite a small fund, so um, 10 to 15 million target size. So we have 30 investments upcoming uh, the next two years. And maybe last um, but not least, we focus more on web 2.5 use cases, I like to say, as we're not like a pure protocol investor, but more focus on typical SaaS or infrastructure or marketplaces models, but clearly within the web three ecosystem. And uh, yeah, excited to be here today. Thanks. Great, thanks. Hello, Abdullah. everyone. Uh, hi, I am uh, Abdullah from Outlier Ventures. Outlier Ventures is the largest uh, Web3 accelerator with a portfolio of 220 companies. And within Outlier Ventures, I'm the head of the Ascent program. Ascent is Outlier Ventures token launch program where we help um, OV portfolio companies as well as external companies that we work with launch their tokens. And uh, before uh, moving into the Ascent team, I was the program manager of Outlier Ventures DeFi Basecamp Accelerator program. And yeah, great to be here today. Thanks for having me. Thanks a lot for your introductions. I'm really looking forward to the Q&A session later. And now I would like to hand over to Melissa, who will introduce the startups. Thanks, Yona. So, now I'll move on to introduce each of the startups. In this pitching order, we will first have Team Run the Ship, a platform that allows users to create their own investment clubs or DAOs to collectively invest in a variety of options from tokens, uh, NFT projects to startups. Next, we have Team Block Frauds, which was incubated by CB Labs. So they're aiming to help insurers detect fraud with advanced speech and image analytics. And they also engage in compliance sharing in a blockchain-based fraud bureau. Third, we have Strive Network. The team enables NFT holders to rent or sell the utility layer of NFTs for other users to buy, sell, and engage with the utilities without investing in the NFT. And finally, we have Team Nitra a Web3 platform that simply enables everyone to co-own songs from their favorite musicians. So each of these teams will be given seven minutes to pitch and they will immediately face four minutes of question and answers with our two judges. And at the end of the pitch event, we will announce the top two startups for this round based on the judges scoring using our rubric. And as for the judging requirement, um, next slide, Riona. Each startup will be evaluated on these four criteria by the judges. So we're just quickly going through them. First will be the market potential. The startup will be judged on whether they are solving an actual problem faced by many and whether their solution is effective. Next, technical feasibility. We'll be looking at how the startup integrates blockchain technology into its project and whether it provides a novel use case. Third, funding plans. Well, this would be good because the startup will be judged based on how well they are, they are on the clarity of their funding plans and how well they intend to, to manage their funds. And lastly, the strength of the founding team. So the judges will be evaluating 
the competency of the team as well as the roles and responsibilities split. So are this are the team members equipped and confident to deliver the project according to the roadmap and the milestones? So without further ado, uh, let's kickstart the pitching. Uh, let's welcome Team Rundership and Graham. Graham, would you like to share your screen? Yep. Okay, great. Thanks for having us. Welcome to Run. At RUN, we are building the infrastructure to enable the next wave of investors. Investors that create homophily and can collectively invest in anything. Oops. Our mission is simple. We are empowering investors with freedom and opportunity. The current problem with the investment landscape is that the barriers to accreditation uh, are quite limited and the investment in efficiency is quite outdated. For example, 7% of households in the US only qualify as accredited investors. And that's a similar percentage in many countries. The current process is um, limits participation, particularly in certain communities. And this does limit the flow of capital to startups, et cetera. It's costly in terms of time and, um, <clears throat> and you get wrapped up in legal paperwork. The average cost is upwards of 4K to actually get this set up. Introducing our investment DAO. We are creating an investment club for all. You can essentially set up your investment club within minutes with Run. You can add members via a link. You can set goals and you can invest in a lot of things. It's, it's quite axiomatic what you can invest in, but the use cases for this, are, you can be quite imaginative and there's, there's many things that you can invest in. It's effortless, it's affordable, it takes five minutes to set up. There's zero paperwork. You do not need to have um, ample experience in blockchain or crypto, you just need a wallet. Uh, the average price to set up one of these is the price of a gas fee, it could be $20 on Ethereum, it could be way less on Polygon, for example. And you can have up to 99 members within this club, which follows SEC guidelines. Some features of our investment club, we essentially tokenize your investment club. So you can invest together with friends, you can see your cap table quite visible, you can see the share ownership of who, who owns what in the club. We have built this on Ethereum and we have L2 support for Polygon and some others coming. And we also simplify the legal process to enable your DAO to convert to an LLC to bring any off-chain investments in equity startups, etc. Not only that, we are gamifying this experience of investment clubs. So we want to have teams compete. We don't need to know your names. We just need to know your investment club and how it operates. And with this, we can track number of deals, ROIs on particular NFTs, for example, how you collect different NFTs. Um, and with this, we can also match this with our Launchpad marketplace. So we can have you know, participation from these investment clubs and what they invest in in our marketplace and how we reward that participation. The rise of DAOs is growing exponentially. And I think over the next two years, we will see that rise. There is a parallel overlap with the DeFi space growing. But if you look at Treasury Deep DAO, for example, there's quite a lot of funds being used towards DAOs. And we also want to touch on launch pads. If we look at Binance, for example, their launch pad in terms of funding is, is growing. So we will also um, build that um, in parallel. Our team is building barriers to um, break down these walls of investment opportunities. And we have quite an experienced team in crypto. Myself, I've worked on a number of crypto projects. I launched uh, the first play to earn platform on Binance Smart Chain. And we have an um, experienced product designer who has worked on numerous crypto projects. And we have a um, uh, a strong advising team as well, Rawson, who is also an investor in us. He has um, previously worked at Tomasic, so he also knows the investment space quite well. And just to wrap up, our, our technology is to, um, firstly, it's decentralized, but it also brings a lot of investor control. We are empowering community investment, and we are in driving this investment with healthy competition. Some key milestones for us, we were accepted into consensus second startup uh, cohort. Uh, our first product we launched last year, which we onboarded quite a number of startups, 50 in total. 
And these startups are ready to actually take on funding. So we will work that into our launch pad. And we closed our seed round last year and Q2. We have a healthy burn rate and our next raise will go towards further product development, uh, working, uh, adding some team members and also marketing and partnerships. And that's it. Thank you. Thanks so much for that, Graham. So now we can move into the Q&A with the judges. Maybe as a first question, um, just to clarify, so is this about investing in underlying equity of startups or in revenue share agreements or future revenue of startups? So there's there's two ways. The first way is that your investment club can invest in anything that's on chain. So you can invest in NFTs together. You can invest in tokenized projects. You can pool funds together to invest in I don't know, goals by your investment club to become an accredited investor. We will have a partnership to convert your DAO into an LLC. And that's essentially then you can invest in um, equity startups. And what would that mean for the retail user? Because to my understanding, SEC guidelines means that you, to be an accredited investor in the US, you need to have, um, I think, 200,000 per year income on a consistent basis or 1 million net worth above. So does that apply? then also to the retail investor invest in DAO? Or what do you mean exactly with no no so that guidelines? so 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 we're actually going against that. So that's the problem that people face. It's it's over a hundred K um that you need to have as an accredited investor for a number of years and a track record in investments as you as you as you know. Um, so what we're doing is we're allowing people to create investment clubs to invest uh, firstly into on-chain activity. But having people pool this together, pool money together, you will reach that threshold and you can then convert your DAO into an LLC, which then can invest into startup equity. So that's one way we have around it. The investment club itself, with SEC guidelines, allows 99% of So to, to have certain funds to invest in equity startups, you can pool that together with a number of people. And are there any minimum requirements for that from an SEC standpoint? No, no. So this is this is currently being done through Doula, which help create your DAO into an LLC for investments. And as a retail investor, I can participate with a dollar upwards, basically. Correct. Understood. Yeah. So we're, yeah, we're we're breaking down those barriers to. I mean, we will see a mix of um, how people will use the investment clubs. But because we launched our first product and we have a lot of those startups waiting, we do want to tie that into our marketplace and give people access to those startups. Um, I guess I can go next. Um, thanks for the presentation, Graham. Uh, my question is, could you tell us a bit more about the competitive landscape for what you're building? And um, there are a number of investment syndicate, DAO infrastructure, investment club type of projects out there like syndicate.io. Um, could you talk to us a bit about how you're different from them and what your USP is? Yeah, good question. Well, firstly, I think we're still super early. So there is no clear winner in this space. We saw towards the end of last year that the trajectory towards creating DAOs is growing. So the ones that you mentioned simply allow the tools for you to create the investment club and then you're left to your own devices. Uh, what we're doing, we are bringing in different tools because we first launched as a sort of startup launch pad to help startups raise seed funding, for example. So, we, so what makes us unique is that we are bringing that capability in of, hey, these are startups that we have on, on, on offer. We will also have NFT collections. And we're gamifying this experience. And I think that's one key piece missing in DeFi and the DAO space that um, there's not really a fun element to invest in. I, I, I think it's silly sometimes that you just drop funds in and then your funds go into a pool and there's, you know, there's no real um, added value uh, extra in terms of what you get out of that. So we want to create that um, process of healthy competition with investment clubs and, and, yeah, reward those clubs for like active particip participation, particularly in our marketplace. Okay, thanks. Thanks for that.
Thanks, everyone. So now I'll move on to the next startup. We'll invite Block Frauds and Roanna up to pitch. Hello, everyone. Um, can you see my screen now and hear me? Yeah. I'll take that as yes. Wonderful. Well, thank you, uh, Melissa and everyone. Um, and hello, everyone. Um, I'm Rowanda Doe, uh, co-founder and CEO of Fardo Software Limited, um, and we're trading as block frauds. Now, insurance fraud is a massive issue, um, estimated at over $300 billion a year. And it doesn't just affect some faceless companies. It means higher premiums that we customers have to pay. And we're the lucky ones as well, because it means billions of the most vulnerable people worldwide simply can't afford the protections they provide. Um, now, insurers are already spending over $3 billion a year on software to detect fraud, and it's growing rapidly, but there are still unmet needs. So why is it so hard? Um, well, there are loads of reasons. Uh, for a start, there are loads of different types of fraud, uh, and the sheer range and scale of data it can be hidden in now. Um, and it would be so much easier if insurers could share information about both frauds and fraudsters, but they're tightly regulated, uh, like with GDPR here in Europe. Uh, and of course, they don't want to go sharing all their sensitive customer details with their competitors. Uh, and then there's who they're up against as well, because the fraudsters are very tech savvy and agile. Um, they can move much faster than insurers and they know them inside out. So we're focusing on three main aspects here, uh, better detection of fraud, compliance sharing, um, and advanced technology that evolves with the fraudsters. Um, we apply cutting edge technologies, including AI and our proprietary algorithms. Um, our advanced image analytics, they can tell if a picture has been used elsewhere um, or manipulated, and that includes identity document changes. Now, our advanced speech analytics can detect signs of fraud um, and also known fraudsters and deep fakes. And we do this with passive authentication. Um, so the customers don't have to be bothered sort of setting up a voice profile. It just happens as they speak. Um, and these generate um, a claim credibility score together. So the claims handler knows which ones to prioritize for review. But the processing has also anonymized the intelligence. Um, so then it can be seamlessly and compliantly shared. Now I'm using a private permission blockchain to share. Um, and this is for three key reasons here. So first, the insurers retain control over the intelligence in their private node. And that is really important for their compliance. Um, second, only trusted network participants can contribute intelligence and train the model. And that really helps maintain its integrity. Um, and then thirdly, I'm using federated learning for the analytics. Um, now, this was specially designed uh, to train across multiple decentralized edge devices um, where you don't have to exchange the data samples or centralize the data. Um, and it was created specifically to address critical issues around data privacy. Um, so here, the blockchain and the federated learning actually enables um, this seamless collaboration whilst meeting the critical sort of data protection uh, and compliance uh, requirements. Um, and best of all, it acts as a fraud bureau um, so you can better spot known fraudsters or deep fakes or fraudster characteristics. Um, and you can spot multiple claims uh, with voice or images, really. Um, and there's also a network effect. So the federated learning does it faster and wider across all of this intelligence for everyone. Um, and that helps it keep pace with the fraudsters as they evolve. Um, and it never forgets. Um, and this gives a better informed score back to the claims handler um, and all participants get an updated algorithm for that better sort of initial um, flag. Now, our solution will benefit insurers worldwide, um, but also insurtechs whose solutions involve voice or image processing, and they'll benefit from the fraud bureau aspect. Um, we're already having talks um, in that area. Um, and as well as direct access, you can access our solution via platforms such as Claim Technology uh, or as a plugin for other solutions. Um, we ran a pilot of our MVP with Claim Technology. Um, they've got a gateway platform and we're now expanding our trials. So do get in touch if you'd like to take part in those. Um, now, our USP um, is really the federated learning um, enabled by the private blockchain. Um, that helps insurers collaborate so seamlessly and compliantly, which is key for efficiency. Um, there are already databases of claims and fraudsters. But they're much more limited, far less seamless. Um, and they're also easily cheated, you know, just by using a, a different name, a fake name or something. 
Um, some are starting to enhance the sharing, but it's often limited by starting from that limited public information. Um, there are speech analyzers and image analyzers already, again, far less collaborative and seamless. Um, and also all the data that can be deleted under rights to be forgotten, you know, speech or image, it, it just gets lost um, to this collaboration um, or of an insurer leaves a database. But our AI and our fraud bureau keeps that anonymized learning forever. Um, so we've got some great feedback already um, to investors, um, Outlier and CV. Uh, we were runners up in R3's quarter in Short Tech Challenge 2020. And we're one of just six companies uh, that was selected by the European Commission's Block Start program uh, for its final pilot phase. And we got great feedback from their experts. Uh, we've got a B2B SaaS uh, business model. Um, there are benefits from standalone use, especially for the larger customers, um, as well as from the collaborative for bureau. Um, pricing evolves from free use initially, um, while we see the data uh, training model in these trials. Um, but then likely evolving through cents per use as it gets established um, to licenses um, and ultimately value sharing and other revenue models. Um, we've got associated services from the outset, um, loads of other functionality planned. Um, and of course, it's perfectly placed to support use in the metaverse uh, with all the speech and image analytics. Uh, and many of the functions can also benefit um, other industries such as insurance or anywhere, or uh, well, finance rather, sorry, or anywhere um, where identity is important. Um, we've got a detailed agile roadmap supported by a detailed uh, financial plan. Um, so I'm actually a chartered accountant by training um, over 20 years of FTSE experience, FTSE 100 experience um, in business development, mergers and acquisitions, general management. So believe me, I can do the detail uh, as well as the strategy. Um, and we have a phased agile business model um, with a typical funding profile. Um, we're going to update our model um, and next funding ask after these current trials. Um, current plan has assumed a two and a half million raise, uh, but if demand is there, then we might call for more to accelerate expansion. Um, and we know where the spend is required. So there's technical development and support. Um, that includes access to commercial libraries, support from language and other fraud experts internationally, um, all the marketing, business development, client success, regulatory requirement, always far more admin than you'd ever want or need or expect. Um, so we know what needs doing. Um, Sold up with CTO and head of innovation at Hiscox, a major UK insurer, over 25 years experience in finance and insurance. I've got really complimentary business experience. Um, we've got a strong team and network ready to scale with the plan, including the tech and commercial partners we're working with. So if you would like to join our fight against fraud or hear any more, then please do get in touch. Thank you. Thanks for that. We'll move into the Q&A now. Thanks for your pitch, Juana. Um, this was almost more like a sales pitch. Uh, I quite enjoyed the, the narration <laughs> style. Um, I got a couple of questions. So maybe uh, first one, like, what is the core problem that you're trying to solve here? Is it, or like, not just that you try to solve, but that exists in terms of insurance fraud? Is it that the insurances don't communicate enough among each other in terms of like, frauds that have been reached, uh, like handed in or claimed um, for several insurance at the same time? Or is it more that the identity of the claims that are made are often fraudulent, like from a priority yeah. standpoint? Yeah, um, it's it's a lot of them, um, to be honest. And that's one of the joys. There are so many problems that our, our core solution can solve. Um, the first one that was flagged to us was through the quarter challenge uh, 2020, which was around um, enabling collaboration in claims. Um, because, for example, if I you know, have a, a claim I want to make on my house, maybe my car has been stolen or something, you know, I can call Allianz um, and make a claim um, or something. But I could then call Aviva and they may not know. Um, there's only this limited public information available. Um, and by the time someone's tagged me as a fraudster, they won't necessarily be able to share that very um, quickly. So it's the timeliness of sharing. And it's when you can tag um, a known fraudster um, and then everybody on the network already knows, OK, they're a known fraudster. Um, and also the image sharing, um, very seamless, very timely. It's that seamless collaborative 
um, and compliance sharing that's key. Um, and it's all in a, a context, um, you know, since COVID, insurers have become far more digital um, and the customers of the insurers are also far more digital. You know, they want an online experience, they want it seamless, um, and there's a thing, you know, straight through processing. Um, so you want something that's digitally um, engaged um, here in the ecosystem. So when the information is provided, it can very quickly be flagged up as a problem or no, nope, we can't see a problem. This isn't a known fraudster. You know, there isn't somebody else that sounds like this person making a claim at the same time. Um, you know, you can go straight through, no flags. So really it's it, a lot of it is around the seamless um, compliant collaboration. Um, but there's also, how do you spot the fraudsters in the first place? How do you spot the deep fakes? Um, how do you spot that a driving license has been manipulated? Um, and that's our initial um, solution. Um, and we're trying to be really connected as well. So, for example, um, there's a company which tags, they have an app um, that takes a picture um, and it tags the geodata, you know, the time and the location. Does that match uh, with the details of the claim? Um, and we don't do that. Um, certainly not at the moment, but we could incorporate their score into our algorithm. Um, so again, it can flag up um, in our score and help just with this seamless, quick processing. This is a B2B product, I assume, right? So you have to sell the product most to insurances um, from like across all the verticals that exist from the conversations that you had so far, like which industry vertical of insurance cases specifically seems to be having this problem like the most which one is the most approachable from your conversation so far when it comes to your um, go-to-market strategy in the coming month yeah. um well there are two areas where it's particularly um attractive one is the high um, volume low value um stuff where you just want to skim things through you know if, if it's you know 500 pounds for a laptop something like that you know a thousand pounds for a carding um you don't want to spend a lot insurers don't want to spend a lot of money investigating each one um so this can really help with these efficient processing of claims um for those high volume low value claims uh, but then the sheer scale, um, you know, a lot of the value is actually in the life and health, particularly in the healthcare um, side of things, people pretending they're injured when they're not, people inflating claims. That's where our speech analytics can detect, you know, is there a problem? Do they sound like they're, they're lying um, or are they a known fraudster? So that's the value. Um, but our initial go to market actually has been because um, I don't know if you've worked with insurance much at all, but they they have major processes to go through. They're not necessarily the quickest workers. So um, our go to market is starting actually with insure techs um, who work in the sort of claims and fraud space, much more nimble, much more agile, partnering with with those where our fraud bureau um, can complement um, the other solutions they offer. And we're in talks with, with several there. All right. Thanks so much Thanks. for that. We're out of time as well. So we're going to move on to the next team, Strive Network. Thanks so much, Rowena. Thank you all. Hi, everyone. How's everyone doing today? Hi. Hello, judges. Awesome. So my name is Karthik. I'm the founder and CEO at Strive Network. And uh, we are building the protocol layer for NFTs and NFT utilities. So in a non-jargonistic way, that means that we are allowing for shareability and tradability for uh, NFT utilities uh, specifically. Um, so what is the problem that we're trying to tackle is that in the last year, one and a half years, um, NFTs have gone mainstream. And uh, in the last six, eight months, we've seen a lot of these NFT projects uh, not being able to grow. So they've moved towards building utilities. Um, but what's happened is that a lot of these utilities continue to remain unused um, or underused uh, because NFT projects uh, struggle to grow. It's, it's hard for them to retain their communities. We've seen NFT projects with 50,000 um, community members, but their holder base continues to be small, anywhere between 4,000 to 6,000. Out of this, about 20, 25% of the holders actually use these utilities. So generally any NFT project today has about 1,000, 2,000 people actually using the utilities of the project. And that's because these utilities are not in the hands of the entire community, but only in the hands of the holder base. Again, the market is purely driven by the investment side of things. A lot of these holders are looking for an ROI on their NFT investment. Um, and if they don't get the ROI, they start selling these NFTs essentially. 
And today it's very difficult to own NFTs in a customized way. You cannot own the NFT in the way you want to own it. Um, pick and choose sort of the utilities that you want with it, um, that come with it. So we are solving for this problem. And how are we solving is by um, enabling the shareability and tradability of uh, the utility layer of NFTs. We're doing this in a couple of ways. One is by creating unique fractions um, for each utility, such as token gated event access, airdrops, staking, and much more. So if your NFT offers you event access, merch, airdrops, staking, and much more, you can create unique fractions and start um, listing them for sale or rent. So you can then put these up for sale or rent um, and start monetizing on the underused value of your NFT utilities. And you can also then start um, getting these utilities discovered on the Stripe Network Utility Marketplace. Um, so you don't have to sell your NFT or someone doesn't have to own the entire NFT to start uh, accessing the N utility layer of these NFTs. You can go to these events, you can access staking, you can access airdrops without actually having to invest in the NFT. So what does our product essentially entail? There are three components. One is a marketplace, which is a utility specific marketplace. So on our marketplace, there are no um, NFTs per se. Uh, it's just going to be utilities from various projects. So if there's BAYC uh, that collaborates with us, we will have all the utilities of BAYC listed and non-holders of BAYC can come and buy these utilities or rent these utilities. We have an SDK. It starts with an API and then eventually graduates to an SDK where uh, basically projects can integrate with us, start getting their NFT holders to um, list or re uh, rent or sell their utilities on our marketplace. And then there's a launch pad where essentially NFT projects can come and launch new utilities or projects or dApps can come and launch uh, entire utility collections. Um, so as I said, there's conditional ownership and fractional ownership of utilities, particularly not NFTs. Um, so what are the main features? You can buy, uh, rent, subscribe to utilities. You can create fractions for these utilities, set conditions for the ownership of the utility, and as well as time-based ownership of these utilities. And why is, why is it important to separate the utility layer from the NFT's intrinsic value is because it allows holders to continuously generate passive income. A lot of holders don't use all the utilities. Uh, and when they need liquidity, they end up selling the NFT. So now this way, when there's unused value, they can sell that unused value or rent it out. Um, it allows the greater community to start accessing. Not everyone has money to buy a BAYC, but they want to attend BAYC events um, and they want to basically get access to merch and staking and airdrops. So they can do that with, with spending much less money and become part of the sort of uh, the community and get access to the services. Um, and projects get access to ideal customers. So a lot of the customers of the project might be outside of the holder base. So projects can now get access to a larger community that might be interested in what they're building. Um, and this also allows them to increase their community retention rates and continuously generate more revenue for themselves. Um, so we're targeting a fairly uh, growing, a quickly growing market. There's about 30 million NFT holders globally. And uh, we're starting with Ethereum and EVM chains, moving on to Solana and plan to be multi-chain over a period of time. Right now, there are 80,000 projects on Ethereum and about 50,000 on uh, Solana. And total about $6.5 billion has been invested in NFTs globally. Um, so we have a large user base currently uh, in India with some presence in Dubai slash Middle East, but we also have a very uh, decent presence in uh, Europe and we're taking a pretty global approach right from the start. We, uh, in terms of our target audience, we are B2B2C. So the main players that we're targeting are NFT collections with utilities, um, NFT collections looking to launch more utilities, dApps that are looking to launch utility collections, um, and then lastly, obviously, on the consumer side, it's going to be the NFT users and general Web3 users um, in the space. Competitors, there are three, four players. It's not it's not a very mainstream product that, that we're building. Um, so there's Cardinal that is one of the biggest players. Uh, obviously, it's only on Solana um, right now. So it's not, it's not multi-chain. And also, Cardinal does not have a, a marketplace side of things. Um, Tropy is different in the sense that it only allows to create new utilities. It doesn't work with your existing utilities. So it doesn't allow for trading and sharing of existing utilities. And same with Cardinal. It does not allow for um, trading and sharing of existing utilities. Stream and Rentier do take a different approach, which is basically they allow for renting of NFTs so that the other user can get access. But in our case, we don't, um, the user does not need to 
put uh, lose access to their NFT. In the case of stream and renty, once you rent your NFT, you actually lose access to your NFT. In our case, the uh, NFT remains in the wallet of the holder and they can continue to monetize on these utilities. So th those are some of the competitive advantages. Revenue model, um, we have, as I mentioned, we have a launch pad. So we charge 10% fees from that in terms of what is the collection of mint revenue. Annual subscription, it ranges from $5,000 to $10,000, depending on your community size, how many users are bringing in. And we have a monthly model as well, which can be anywhere between dollar to $2 per user uh, per month. Um, and we charge a 0.1% transaction fees on the platform. So we've been acquiring users through multiple ways. We've um, run live courses on crypto, NFT metaverse. We do giveaways. We've launched our own utility collection on Solana, and we plan we plan to launch our own token as well. So we've done some revenue, which was about 1.65 million um, last year. Total, we've done now 2 million. Um, we have 150,000 plus community members who are also on the wait list for our product. Discord and Telegram, about 60 and 10,000 plus. Um, and uh, yeah, in the coming months, we plan to launch uh, our uh, web app this month. Our mobile app goes live in the next two months. We've uh, started partnership talks with the likes of um, Tezos, Polygon, Startnet, Asset Mantle, Push Protocol, Axelar, a lot, all of these are very interested in getting us on board. And we've started technical integrations with a lot of them. Um, and in terms of team, I graduated from UC Berkeley. I worked in their uh, blockchain lab and been in the blockchain space for about six years. Uh, I also worked in Deloitte's blockchain team uh, and went on to, after that, launch my own uh, crypto fund that uh, did a 20x in one year. Um, and then I have my CTO on the call as well, Sanita, I'll let her introduce. And we have really good advisors. Since we are based in India, we have Anupam Mittal as our investor. He is also a shark, judge in Shark Tank. We have the head of GeoGenX Fund, which is the uh, fund for uh, Reliance, which is one of the largest conglomerates in India. Um, so I'll let Sanita also jump in, introduce herself and her background once, and then um, we can go into the questions. Yeah, sure. Thanks. We don't have much time, so let's make it a bit more brief. Thanks right. so much. Uh, Sanita, I've been in the space for the last six years, started as a quantitative analyst for a crypto investment bank called Almora, later um, worked on multiple projects with their DeFi architecture, uh, refining their tokenomics and a lot of things and worked on uh, ESG compliance and getting on uh, getting ESG compliance onto blockchain with Richmond DAO and started with Stripe last year and helping with the tech. Thank you. Thank you. And we've raised 500k in pre-seed, raising 3 million um, as our seed round. Thank you, everyone. Thanks so much for that. We're moving to the Q&A now. Maybe, uh, Afghan, maybe you want to go first this time. Yeah, thanks a lot, Benjamin. Um, so my question is, everything looks great. Um, given recent events, especially with what's happening with like uh, Paxos, now Circle, um, whenever the word fractionalization is mentioned in crypto and blockchain, um, there's always a risk of whatever token is being fractionalized, being considered a security. So how are you thinking about this from a regulatory perspective, especially if there's things like staking that are being fractionalized or, or rented out? Um, so frankly, uh, just to, uh, there are two parts for this. Uh, in the utility protocol, uh, where the NFT need not be in the user's wallet to get access to the utility, we are not fractionalizing anything there. It's just the access to the owner's wallet, uh, read-only access um, to through the owner's wallet that the user get and will be using the utilities. And I don't think there are any kind of regulatory challenges that we may face on this part. And fractionalization, we only use it for time-based ownership for gaming assets or music assets mm -hmm. where... Uh, the NFT has to be in the user's wallet for the experience. Uh, say, uh, and time-based ownership to brief about that. Say, for example, all four of us have 25% of the stake in that particular gaming asset. All four of us will be getting 25% of the time to play with that particular NFT in that game. Uh, so that way, uh, we are uh, either, uh, you know, we are investing your time or money it becomes fractionalized there or, as well, right? So the time you invest to uh, upgrade your uh, gaming asset or the money you invest to get that gaming asset lessons over there. And hard, there, I think there are hardly any regulatory compliance that we go through because of this, because we are not dealing with any kind of real time assets at this point in time. 
So also, I mean, in terms of compliance, we are operating out of Dubai as an entity. So um, we've already achieved, got the NFT marketplace license from there based on uh, describing our activities and things like that. So from a compliance standpoint, we are compliant with the jurisdiction that we operate in. Yeah. Okay, maybe just to follow on to that. Um, so I understand the part about like getting access to games and uh, so on, but you also mentioned staking as something that uh, is being fractionalized, if I'm not mistaken. So can you expand on that a bit or like people being able to to get the staking functionality out of an NFT that gives that uh, utility? No. So over there, what happens is there are financial utilities for all your NFTs, right? So like staking your NFT and uh, or uh, participating in some liquidity pools or airdrops and all of this. So for that, we uh, have a different, uh, we have another option for the users where say, for example, the user doesn't have the bandwidth to manage their NFT or doesn't have the bandwidth, uh, you know, uh, to stake and unstake and on time and all of that. So he can actually give the acts, uh, delegate access to somebody else uh, and have a profit sharing basis over there. So somebody else will be uh, managing your uh, staking and stuff on a profit sharing basis, like 80, 20 or something like that. Okay, understood. Thanks for that. But maybe uh, to add on that, um, doesn't it inflate then the uniqueness of NFTs and platform? So to get back to the example, let's say I have an NFT that represents an in-game asset in a specific video game, um, and it's like super unique or rare, and, and I'm the owner of it, but I fractionalize it into 100 parts. Does it mean that these 100 people, if 100 people buy it, they can access it simultaneously, or how would that how would that work specifically? Uh, people cannot access it sim simultaneously, right? As I said, it's a time-based ownership and there will be governance rules that will be governing on uh, what time people will be using it. Like maybe you have to, uh, you know, book your slot to play with that particular NFT if you have a tournament or something. And it, everything is mentioned in the governance rules that, and by the owner who fractionalizes it. The fractions are basically but, like, like a timeshare fraction is for gaming assets specifically. So for just like how you would have your real estate timeshare, it's very similar to that, where you would basically three people own it or four people own it. They get 25% of the time for the usage of that in-game asset. And then whatever you get 25% of the revenue also from playing that game, if there is uh, earnings that you have in that game. So that's how the... What, for it. Understood. What's the difference then between just renting it out? Just just to, to clarify, so when does it make sense to rent it out versus to to fractionalize it? Then in this context, so this happens. Uh, this is applicable only not 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 only for games. It uh, it is applicable for all kind of entertainment NFTs, whether it's music or games or uh, or AR VR kind of stuff. Uh, where only gamers know mostly like there is a sense of ownership that is very important on a particular asset, like, and you cannot just get it by renting it out and also it carries a monetary value uh, in secondary markets and all of this so renting is also there uh, as one of the options but uh, this gives a better sense of ownership on any kind of musical or entertainment assets that you own this particular game uh, not, know, just, not just sense of ownership no, but thanks very much for that we're actually out of time for the q a segment you can follow up you know any thanks, questions guys. you have yeah Thank we can you. connect you with email as well so we're going to move on to the next team in the interest of, you know, ending the event on time as well. So I'll have Brian, Andy, and Sensia one on to share their screen and then. So I'm one of co-founder of Netra. So at Netra, we democratize music asset to Web3. Yeah, you can go Brian when you're ready. Okay. So music is an asset. Um, Justin Bieber just sold his master for 200 million. Michael Jackson and other big artists have sold uh, their master rights and music ownership for millions of dollars. And this is a huge master asset class that produce uh, royalties and investment. But the current problem is most of this rights is owned by the large label or big investment firm which the public doesn't have access to, and the label will pay in advance, but they take a hefty cut in the royalty. Firm currently can only buy a whole of the ownership of a song, which when it's being bought by the firm, the artist has no longer a sense of ownership. And 
by far, uh, in average, the artists only get 12 to 15% of revenue in the end with little to no transparency. So our solution is with Netra. At Netra, we enable the public to, to uh, invest in music and they can, can prom uh, because they have ownership in the song, they are incentivized to uh, listen to the song and promote to the song and it will grow uh, organically. The artists will get it, getting paid directly uh, from their fans without middlemen. And the artists can also uh, sell partial ownership of their song. So they don't need to sell the whole ownership of the song. And the, so the artists still have sense of ownership here because everything is happening on blockchain. Uh, there's no middleman and everything is direct to public and transparent. So we're taking the music investment from the Wall Street to the Main Street. So just to recap, Natura fractionalized music asset in a form of NFTs. So using the blockchain, uh, everything is fairly distributed. Everything is transparent. And this ownership is uh, perpetual in blockchain. So we can see in 2022, uh, the physical sales for music, the music industry is going down. But the streaming is inclining, and this is where we're tapping in. So right now, our uh, target, uh, direct target, is Indonesia, but we're going to Asia right now too. So the product is quite simple. So artists will collaborate with Neta to fractionalize their music, uh, and buyers can buy directly from our platform, and we distribute their songs, the artist songs, directly to streaming platforms to Spotify, Apple Music, and YouTube Music, which every streams will give royalty to the songs and we'll distribute this royalty to the FMA holders, our fractional music asset. And the FMA or the NFT uh, act like an access pass to the dashboard so they can uh, see how is the song performing, uh, how many ownership they have, and they can claim it directly uh, uh, by USDC. So this is like a royalty bank uh, for the music. So in short, why fans you in Etra? Because they can get uh, an investment up to 20 APR per year. And the artists, they can get upfront money directly from their fans uh, without losing their ownership. And they can also get an upfront cash. So to implement everything seamlessly for mass adoption, uh, we've implement uh, semi non custodial uh, way. So you can sign in with Google or they can choose to go to totally web three using wallets and using fiat currency or cryptocurrency. So our business model is, so we call bait with artists and we distribute their songs to streaming platforms and we fractionalize their ownership into ERC 721 uh, NFT. And uh, uh, buyers will buy the NFT directly from our platform and we will share the royalty that we got from streaming platform directly uh, to the FMA holders using smart contract. So our business model is we take 15% for every sales on the platform and 1.5% uh, for the secondary sales. And we're built on Polygon. So currently uh, we have around 190K, uh, we've distributed 190K of royalties and total sales of NFT to artists and fans. And we've sold around 3,600 NFTs. So right now we've onboarded uh, most, uh, most major artists in Indonesia with more than 100 mil 150 million fans and 100 million streams per month. And we're going to take our platform uh, to public to scale. So currently we are on curated phase. So we curate uh, major artists to bring traction to the platform. And by Q3 this year, we're going to open to public so everybody can create their FMAs and publish their songs to streaming platform directly and distribute their royalties directly uh, via streaming platform. So this is our, these are our team. We have Stiawan. Uh, in the, has been in the music industry, in the Indonesian music industry for more than 30 years. Uh, I'm myself in charge in the operation and product. My background is tech. And we also have Farah CTO and Pandya strategic officer.
We also have board of advisor uh, from one of the Indonesian largest central exchange, Indrosman, a legendary music uh, musician in Indonesia. And we have Dennis Adeswara, a, a web free influencer in Indonesia. Thank you. Thanks very much for that, Brian. Uh, we'll be inviting the judges now to start their QA. So yeah, maybe just- Stella, do you want to start well. the last one? Yeah, thanks a lot, Benjamin. Um, so I think I have the qu same question here that I had um, for Team Strive, which is about um, the fractionalized NFTs being considered security. So can you talk a bit more about that, especially given what's been happening recently? Um, yeah, I'm going to take over that question. Yeah, actually, it is a valid concern that uh, from the SEC perspective. So I think uh, right now, but in the other part of the world, it's actually OK. So uh, our solution is basically we probably cannot sell to US market for now. But in our defense, it's actually uh, what we in Indonesia itself and in, in several countries would consider the security is when an asset is, uh, you, you own the asset and it all, it has a profit and expenses, like revenue and expenses. And, and, and music asset only has revenues. Basically, it has no, uh, expenses so just it's just a profit share from the stream of the uh, revenue that's coming in okay thank you for that thanks for, for yeah. clarifying hey, just a basic question so just to to clarify um so you're directly competing with music labels correct uh uh actually we uh, we're not competing with music labels music label on the master we actually open to collaborate with them right now we are in the talk in uh, several uh, the big three labels sony universal and uh warner so we can become the bad their back end yeah but are you not competing directly with regarding the royalties because if i can uh, invest in the underlying royalties of a new song of an artist that's being released then my understanding is that's exactly that's the core business of what music labels do, no? Uh, in a way, yes, but uh, uh, they they don't they are not open uh, right now. Uh, for for example, we have a lot more of artists untapped by the major labels. You uh, you can only have the big three, right, owning the most catalogs, right? But there are growing uh, many more growing artists outside of the three major labels. So that's where we tap in actually. Understood. So, but this means that it narrows down your potential market to new artists um, with new songs specifically, right? Because down the line, to my understanding, IP rights um, are valid sometimes even for decades and, and, and they're owned by the major labels in, in most cases for the records that are already out there since decades. So I guess that's on a market that you that you can effectively target down the road. Or would you disagree with that? Uh... Yes, in in, uh, in the way the way you put it, yes, correct. Uh, but on the on the the other side, also major labels uh, like, for example, we are right now exploring with Sony. They will try on Warner. They will try to release some uh, new artists, couple of artists uh, with Netra. So actually, uh, they, they they want to get into the Web three. So they they will call they will collaborate with us for a couple of new artists. Yeah. So for you, actually, last for... question. Uh, Brian, we'll yeah, ahead, so for, for yeah, so for a huge label uh, and artists, uh, uh, their advantage by joining Netra, they can ga gain an extracting future value of their royalty uh, into the FMEs that uh, sold directly on the platform. So they will get advanced too. It will benefit their uh, them too. And maybe last question from my side: um, Is this? competing with within the web three space is audios uh, something on the competitive map that you look currently at the track or who do you see as a threat from within the web three space working on a similar solution audios is we see audios is not a direct competitor because audios uh give token as a royalty uh which what we're doing right now is we take the royalty from the web two companies such as spotify and apple music and directly we bring it to the web three platform 
our current uh, Apple to Apple direct competitor is Royal.io, but our advantage uh, with uh, more than Royal.io is Royal.io still have it uh, doesn't have the direct integration to streaming platform, which the royalty uh, report cannot be verified. But Netra, we directly connect to streaming platform, which we can verify that the streaming uh, report is real and directly distributed to the fans. Thanks so Understood. much. And that is all the time we have Thank for Q&A for okay. Team Netra. Okay. Uh, so right now, Yona will just bring us back to and make some announcements. Yeah. Thanks a lot for the fantastic pitches and also thanks to Benjamin and Abdallah for the great uh, Q&A. So in case you want to run your own blockchain startups like these teams, uh, we've opened applications for season three of the BFG Superstars program. Uh, the program will take place from March to June this year. And in case uh, you're interested or you want to know more, just scan the QR code or visit our website to learn more about it and apply. The application deadline is uh, in two days. So uh, yeah, just, just a short time left. So um, the results are in. Yeah. And we are really excited to announce the top two teams. So the first team that to come in, you know, would be Team Stripe. So congratulations, Karthik. Thank you. Thank you, everyone. Thank you, judges. Really appreciate it and looking forward to the feedback. Yeah, no problem. And in second place, we have Team Run, Run the Ship. So that's Graham. Congratulations. Uh, thanks a lot, everyone. Yeah, so, yeah, all good. I'll hand it back to Yona to make the announcements and to just finish up the program. Yona, are you okay? Sorry? So uh, you you just finish up the final notes as well. Oh, uh, yeah. Um, yeah. Thanks a lot for, uh, again, the startups that we're pitching and uh, the judges that we had today. Um, feel free to reach out uh, to us, as mentioned before, or also to uh, our colleagues, uh, John and uh, Max, in case you want to get in direct contact with uh, the startups, in case uh, you're investors and interested to collaborate with us. Um, it was a great uh, pitch event. Thanks to everyone. Thank you, everyone. Thanks a lot. Thanks, Thanks for having everyone. us. Thank you. Thank you so Thank much. You. Bye. Thank you. Thank you. Bye bye. Thank you so much for having us.